Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and get started because it's already 1201. Um, so thank you for joining. My name is Horace. I am an event host at Horseations, and uh, this is the eighth free mixology course that I'm offering. Thank you for joining. So first off, disclaimer, I was never a bartender. I only bar backed, but it was a brief amount of time before COVID-19 took over. Um, it was an interesting experience and I do love mixing cocktails. I love the flavors. And so that's why I'm just trying to offer this to anybody who likes to join. Um, so of course, thank you very much for choosing to join this session and hopefully future sessions uh, over all the other plethora of info out there on YouTube, on blogs nowadays. There's so much info out there. So I appreciate you joining this session. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started then. Uh, let's go ahead and just mix up the Mai Tais and share so that you can see my countertop. Feel free to ask any questions anytime in the chat box. If you have any comments, questions, feel free to type it in. I can stop whatever to answer your questions. So let's go get started. So the Mai Tai, continuing on with the rum cocktails because it is summer, is a very simple drink to make. Now, the thing is, it was very simple back in the day. And it was so simple to the point that people got so confused on what a Mai Tai truly contained. There was just so much different uh, ingredients. It just said, well, it should contain rum, it should contain citrus juices, and it should contain some herbs, some oils, and great, just mix it all together. So it was just really confusing. And so it was actually not until Trader Vic, uh, a very popular name in the tiki culture industry, that he repopularized, <laughs> made tiki culture resurface. He's one of the big names out there, and he basically grabbed a bottle of Jamaican rum. So this is an example that I'll be using, Appleton Estate. Um, and then he mixed it up for his friends and his friends just absolutely fell in love. And so because of that, the Mai Tai was born, it was spread around and it's a very, very simple cocktail to make. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab my shaker tin first. And the first thing we're gonna add is our lime juice. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab a fresh lime, cut the ends so it's easier to squeeze out. And we're gonna go ahead and squeeze three quarters of an ounce. All right, that was a pretty small lime. Usually each lime should yield around one ounce of lime juice, but this one was three fourths, so it was perfect. Afterwards, we're gonna add triple sec. So this is an example of triple sec. Uh, I'm using Cointreau which is a higher ABV compared to the triple sec you might find out there, which usually sits around 15 to 20%. So this holds up to the uh, rum that we're about to use much better, I find. So that's why it doesn't dilute the drink as much, which is what, why I prefer this triple sec in instead. So Cointreau is just an orange liqueur. So just half an ounce. Afterwards, the secret ingredient to all tiki cocktails is Orjo. Now, this is not the original bottle, so I'm not gonna show it off, but Orjo is basically uh, created a syrup created from almonds. And there's plenty of recipes out there online, you can search it up, but it's basically extracting the milk from the almonds and then you're uh, boiling it or you're combining it with sugar and then you're simmering it down and then you get basically Orjo. And so I'm using half an ounce of Orjo in this Mai Tai. So Orjo is very sweet and it's that secret ingredient in cocktails that just makes it like really pop. You probably recognize it the moment you pop open a bottle and you take a whiff. It, it's recognizable instantly. And then, so after that, I'm just gonna go ahead and add our rum now. So the rum I'm gonna use is Appleton Estate. It's just the signature blend um, you can find these in a lot of liquor stores. Real, it's pretty widespread, wide known. Appleton State is really great. So the thing about Jamaican rum is that it's pot stilled, um, and from the pot still, it also is from uses a lot of. Uh, you could say it, it kind of might deter you, but it uses like these tropical composts. So all like the um, like decaying kind of uh, like compost out there, they basically put that in some of the sugar cane, the molasses, and then that's how it's distilled. And so that's why Appleton Estate, or I guess Jamaican rum, has that like really funky flavor and really, really like deep, like really deep. I don't know how to describe it. You got to drink it to just really discover it. Um, but I added one ounce. 
But afterwards, I'm also gonna split the rum. You could add two ounces of that, it's no biggie. But I'm also going to add a 12 year Appleton Estate just to have it have a little bit more of that oak cask taste in there. So I'm gonna add one ounce. So basically a Mai Tai has two ounces of Jamaican rum. So I can already smell it. It's very pungent. It's very, very pungent. And afterwards, just to round it off, I personally like to add a spoon of simple syrup. Now simple syrup is very simple, no pun intended, to make is just one part water, one part sugar, simmer it, and you have your simple sugar. So I always, one thing I always tell people, never buy simple syrup off the shelves because they're just ripping you off. And after that, you have your Mai Tai pretty much. So before I shake it, actually, I'm gonna crush ice because Mai Tais are pretty strong in terms of uh, alcohol content. And so what you wanna do is crush some ice first, fill that in your glass and then top it off. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab what we call a Lewis bag. If you do not have a Lewis bag, which this is what a Lewis bag looks like, um, what it does is it helps wick away the moisture of the ice so that it does not over dilute itself when it melts. So all you need to do is grab, actually I should grab a little bit more just in case. Grab, go. And so what a Lewis bag does, you just hammer it up. There's crushed ice machines out there. You could, if you have a machine itself that makes crushed ice even better. Uh, I don't have one. So being a home home mix, mix mixing drinks, I just use whatever I have in hand. So we have here a Lewis ice bag, relatively cheap, not really expensive. So you can get them on Amazon, really cheap. And there we go, I just top up. And then what we're gonna do next too is shake up our Mai Tai. So I'm only gonna add one ice cube and shake this short shake. Reason for this is because you don't wanna over dilute this because you already have crushed ice in your uh, glass. So it's going to dilute the cocktail anyway. So you just wanna do a very short shake. That's pretty much it. All it is is just like a quick chill. And so if you shake it too long, you might over dilute it and then it won't taste as good. And all you're gonna do is just because it's crushed ice, I'm not gonna double strain. I'm just gonna pour it right in. Ooh, top up. There we go. So let me clean up first. Hosting parties or whatnot, when you clean up, it's definitely a lot better than just leaving your uh, tools all over the place because afterwards when you make the next drink, you can find your tools right away. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and top off with a little bit more of crushed ice. So it's already starting to overfill there, but that's great. So what this does is because it's crushed ice, there's a lot more surface area from ice to liquid. So it's gonna melt faster. And then it helps you hydrate yourself while you're drinking your strong tiki drink. And pretty much all you have to do now is garnish. So I am going to just add a lime wedge. So you can be creative. I'm just gonna use a simple lime wedge, but I've seen people take uh, which I'm not gonna do right here for time's sake. But what I could do is actually take one of these crushed limes. So your next like party or whatnot, you can do this trick. Crushed limes, you kind of like set it on top of your drink. It's a little overfilling right now, but, and then you pour a little bit of overproof rum right here and you light that on fire. And then you put a little cinnamon, dash that, it, it looks amazing. But that's one trick you can do. But all I'm gonna do is just do a simple lime wedge, just like that. Put some two straws and just sip away. All right, so that is the Mai Tai. Really simple, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and take a sip of my Mai Tai. So I wonder what you guys taste, but I instantly get the Orjo. It might be a little bit overly sweet, so I might have to dial down on the Orjo that I put. I put half an ounce, so maybe like a quarter ounce might be more than enough to my taste. I like mine's a little tangy. But that's where you play around. You enjoy, um, that's the joy of mixing drinks. All right. 
That is really good. So instantly too, I get the orjo. And then afterwards that back end taste, I get the pungent kind of um, uh, Jamaican rum kind of funk taste. And it's, uh, let me tell you, it's, it's really good. If you, Appleton Estate, that's my preference. Um, feel free to find your own. Other rums that I like are um, Smith & Cross. Um, aside, but besides Bacardi, that is. I know Bacardi is really well known, um, but like Florida Cana is really good as well. Uh, Plantation is also a good one as well. So I hope you enjoy your Mai Tai. So while we sip on those, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about a little bit of history of tiki culture and how everything began before I move on to the second cocktail of the session. So it all started out with Don the Beachcomber. So this man named Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant was born in 1907 in Texas. And ever since he was young, his grandfather took him to all these voyages out to the sea and also to New Orleans. So at a very young age, he was already exposed to alcohol. And, um, all, but not only alcohol, but also the hula girls, the tiki huts, the statues, the Polynesian culture. It was just really interesting to him. And so being exposed to that, he just was so fascinated with all the island culture out there. And so at 18 years old, his parents gave him a choice. So he could either go to a college or he can take the money and do what he wants with it. Now being an 18 year old guy, what do you think he did? He took the money and ran. He ran, he ran. So he immediately took that money and he roamed out to the sea. He took that money, voyaged out from the Caribbean all the way past the Pacific Ocean to even Singapore, where he got introduced to the Singapore Sling, another very tropical cocktail that you can look up as well. Um, and uh, he was just exposed to all these different cultures and uh, he sailed a lot of islands. And in the end, you know, when you're 18 years old, you want to voyage for six years. At 24 years old, he came back home and he was broke, no money. But what he did bring back was a lot of uh, souvenirs from his trips. So I'm talking driftwood, I'm talking uh, life saving jackets, life jackets, boat parts, random island statues, cups, mugs, like all these weird like items that you can find all over these islands. And so he brought those back and he started getting a job. He was like, okay, I'm gonna work as a dishwasher. He started working as a bus boy. Um, at certain restaurants and establishment, but it was his stories, his endless stories of travel and voyages in the past years that got him attention from uh, people that usually came to the bar. And so these souvenirs eventually, he would, would use them to decorate his own bar that he opened up uh, that he, and he built on Hollywood Boulevard or Hollywood, California, not Boulevard, my, my apologies. And so it was a very island themed shack and it was just very interesting at that time. And people were just like, what is this? This is bizarre. And so he wanted to bring that island flair to the people there. And so what also was interesting to the patrons was not just the island flair of the uh, establishment, but it was also his drinks because his drinks were inspired from all his travels. When he went to the Caribbean, when he went to um, Singapore, when he went all over the many small islands in the Pacific Ocean, he got inspired by all this knowledge that was taken in the travels. And so, hence, we have things like the Mai Tai. There's other drinks out there you probably heard of, like the Zombie, Planner's Punch, um, the Scorpion Bowl. Um, and you probably now kind of get a sense of like, well, when I visit a tiki bar, there's always these bizarre decorations out there, but it's an, a pay, homage, it's paying homage to Don the Beachcomber because he decorated it with all his souvenirs from his voyages. And so his drinks from his combined knowledge of all his travels is what got people so interested in tiki. And just for example, another fun fact you can tell your friends next time, uh, he would actually put warning labels on his menus on purpose. It was like a marketing strategy because like, for example, for the zombie cocktail, because they were strong. You, if you had a tiki cocktail, they're very, very strong. They're sweet and they're very dangerous. So he wrote on there, he's like, drinking these are dangerous. If you drink three or more, the last guy went mad and we never saw him again. That's literally what was on the menu. So it like kind of posed the challenge for 
people that went into the bar and they're like, oh no, come on, I can drink more than two, I can drink three. And so it also invited more people to take this challenge of his and eventually like that just brought in more customers and of course more customers, more business and he was a happy man. And it became super well known that this, it's what he was doing was started being termed a phrase of Polynesian pop where you get the typical hula girl, the palm trees, the carvings, the tikis. And it was just like a wonder of like mystery out there. So he just made people fall in love with tiki. Now, Don also served in World War II and he was actually in charge because of his reputation. He was in charge of setting up relaxation camps for soldiers. Um, and so after he served in World War II, he actually opened up more restaurants he actually went to Hawaii to expand. Now, surprisingly enough about Hawaii, it's really funny because you would think once you go to Hawaii back then after World War II, um, there's like there's like typical island, like there should be like typical island establishments here and there. But regardless of that, when he went, he just could not find it because the typical island flair that he was imagining that he's encountered and he's built up all those years um, with Polynesian pop, it just wasn't there because missionaries went there and they built all these Victorian homes and there was no longer any huts, no tiki huts, none of that. And so he was not very happy about that. And so instead he chose like, well, you know what? I should bring back this culture into here. And so he actually went to Hawaii and he, or sorry, Oahu, my apologies. And he kind of re helped revive that tiki culture. And he actually set up the first luau for tourists. And he introduced tourists to what a luau was in Waikiki. And so if you go there to bars around there, you they probably pay homage to Don the Beachcomber because he's the one that really paved the way. And so now that now Don is buried in Oahu, you could, I believe um, last I remember he, last I read, you can visit his grave if you do so, so choose, but know that the luau's for the tourists and the tiki huts and all that expansion of the tiki culture was mainly due to this Don the Beachcomber. Now of course there's other figures out there such I mentioned Vic the Trader. He's actually local from Oakland, California. Uh, I am from the Bay Area so he's actually from Oakland and he made his establishment here and he was also took part in the rise of tiki culture. And there's also Joseph Crane who also helped with the rise of tiki. However, I'm not going to go into detail through to all these because of a lack of time. This is only a half hour session. So uh, I just like to briefly introduce the topic at hand and we'll get on to mixing the drinks. But of course we owe these individuals to the rise of Tiki. And so if you ever have a chance, I mean, I know there's COVID guidelines right now, but if you do have a chance in the near future or whatnot, if you're in the area in San Francisco, please visit Smuggler's Cove in the Bay Area because those guys really pay homage and really it's an ode to uh, Don the Beachcomber and all those uh, people that brought the tiki culture to us, if you have a chance. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm sure you all are waiting now, but that's pretty much the summary of, uh, a brief summary of tiki culture. There's so much more out there. There's uh, there's a, a book you can check out actually by Smuggler's Cove. It's just called The Smuggler's Cove. Um, you can you can check it out. Um, it has a lot of information about tiki cocktails in general, but I'm gonna go ahead and make the second cocktail of the session. So again, feel free to stop me anytime. Go ahead and chat if you have questions or comments in the chat box. I am happy to answer as much as I can to the best of my knowledge. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and make the second cocktail. So I'm gonna put my Mai Tai to the side and I'm gonna go ahead and switch back to my countertop. And so the first thing we're gonna do is grab our shaker tin. This is the planter's punch. Now the fun thing about the planter's punch is that you could find this back then in the Caribbean's, any island you went to in the Caribbean, you could basically be served up a planter's punch. And each planter's punch was different. And that difference depended on what that, uh, that particular island's spices were famous. So if you went to a certain island, they might serve up uh, like more cinnamon. If you went to a different island, they might serve up more allspice. So they usually put in ingredients that reflected 
what was popular in their island and what they used for spices. And so in this case, they do use allspice dram. Unfortunately, I do not have allspice dram, but then I do have uh, Angostura bitters, which is something that you can use to replace that. So Angostura bitters, uh, if you're familiar, if you mix drinks at your home, it's a very standard, it's aromatic bitters from Angostura. Super popular from its oversized label. It's a fun story behind that. And then we're gonna go ahead and do three hearty dashes. All right. So after the Angostura bitters, we're gonna go ahead and add some simple syrup. So again, simple syrup, mine is just one part water to one part sugar. Now, if you want your simple sugar to last longer, uh, an ideal ratio would actually be two parts sugar to one part water. It is actually shelf stable for as long as you want because there's so much sugar in there that it just basically preserves and nothing can grow in it. But I usually keep mine in the fridge just because I'm paranoid. You just never know. And we're gonna go ahead and add three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. Afterwards, we're gonna go ahead and add one ounce of lime juice. So always use fresh lime juice because fresh is always better. All right, one full ounce. There we go. After that, we're gonna go ahead and add a bar spoon of what we have, grenadine right here. I use Jack Rudy's or you can make your own just by using fresh pomegranate and um, sugar. So it's the same concept. You're basically squeezing the pomegranate juice and then you're using sugar. You're doing a slow simmer and then afterwards you have your grenadine. Now, one thing that sometimes people ask me is that is it okay to use the bright red grenadine from um, roses? Uh, ideally, you should not. Uh, reason being is if you're looking at a quality craft cocktail, good tasting one. You don't want to avoid that because if you look at an ingredients, it does have food coloring, but also high fructose corn syrup, which adds an extra layer of sweetness that you probably don't want. And so if you saw, I did add one bar spoon of, so it's just a little bit. And if you notice too, like there's no food coloring in here, it's actually not supposed to be bright red. It's actually dark red. So that's grenadine. And now afterwards, I'm just gonna go ahead and add our rum now. So I'm using Appleton Estate all the time because Appleton Estate is just my go-to. And we're actually gonna add quite a lot. So it's gonna be three ounces of Jamaican rum. There we go. Let's grab our ice cubes. These ice cubes are stuck together, there we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this to my shaker tank. Set that to the side. Again, it's going to be a short shake. All right, so this is just enough to just chill the drink, but not dilute it too much because the ice will do its job with tiki cocktails when you dilute. Because it was a short shake, I'm not gonna double strain. I'm just gonna go ahead and just add it straight in. So this glass is awfully large, so it looks a little awkward. My apologies there, but if you do have crushed ice, it will fill up to the top. But what you can do now is garnish with lime, I mean, sorry, mint sprigs. So I'm gonna take a couple handfuls of mint here, going to smack it. So what smacking does to mint or any herbs of choice, what it does is it releases aromas so that when you put your nose to the glass, it just smells and it'll taste 10 times better because if you've, ever read anything about cooking or anything about cocktails, mixology, a lot of that flavor from a cocktail comes from your nose. Try pinching your nose next time and tasting something, it's totally different. So there we go, this is our planter's punch. Woo, that is a strong, strong cocktail. You're talking three, three full ounces of rum. So pretty much that's it. Um, there's like two minutes left of the session. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to go ahead and take your time to ch chat now. I'm happy to answer any of them, but these are two pretty much simple cocktails that you can make 
uh, for actually National Mai Tai Day on August 30th. So go ahead and sip on those Mai Tais, get ready to make them, surprise your friends, family. Um, stay safe, please. Uh, with COVID-19 right now, um, there is a, the Delta variant, so I'm not gonna talk much about that, of course, but uh, please stay safe. And thank you for, again for joining. I appreciate it again. Uh, you could have chose anyone else but me, but you chose to take your time to join my session. So I really, really appreciate it. If you're interested, go ahead and give uh, Horsey Asians a follow on Instagram, or you can go ahead and check out the Eventbrite. I do have the rest of the year monthly free mixology courses listed. And so you can go ahead and sign up because in September, we're going to be talking about Oktoberfest and uh, beer cocktails. So uh, beer in cocktails, I mean. So there's that to be waiting for. So I'll look, look forward to that. Of course, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, these are a lot of fun for me and I hope you have a lot of fun too. And I hope you learn something new. Not a problem, not a problem. Thank you for joining. Hope you all have a lovely, lovely weekend. It is pretty nice weather now in the Bay Area. Um, stay safe. And uh, okay, well, if there's no more questions, I'm closing it off. Uh, I want to keep everyone here. Well, thank you very much for joining again. And I hope to see you next session in September for Oktoberfest. All right, well, stay safe and good. have a good one. Bye.